Hello, welcome everyone. I'm Lisa Decker, your uh, moderator for today, and I am a certified divorce financial analyst at Divorce Money Matters and founder of Divorce Town USA. And I'm so glad that you are here with us today for our Divorce Help and Hope uh, program. And today we're going to be talking about a healthier way to divorce. And we've got a, a, a very uh, esteemed panel for you. I mean, you're really going to enjoy this show. Um, if you are listening live, uh, you'll be able to put questions in the chat box. And if you are joining us later um, and listening to the recording, you can always reach out to the professionals that you see here uh, via divorcetownusa.com. And we'll also have their uh, contact information in the chat and at the end of the show. So I want to uh, present uh, my first speaker today, Tracy Ann Moore Grant. And Tracy is a colleague and a friend, and uh, she's got a long list of, uh, of um, areas of expertise here. She is an attorney, a mediator, an arbitrator, a guardian ad litem, and a parent coordinator with Patterson Moore Butler Law Firm in Cumming, Georgia. She is also the founder of the Amicable Divorce Network, an organization which vets and educates divorce professionals for amicable divorces so the public can be assured that they are selecting experienced and resolution focused professionals. And I will tell you that this is a fabulous organization I'm very happy to have partnered with. And uh, Tracy Ann, always a pleasure to have you here. So <laughs> I am going to step off the camera and let you go live. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome everybody. Um, as Lisa has stated, my name is Tracy Ann Moore Grant and I um, do all of those things that she stated in the family law system. Um, one of the things that I'm most passionate about is having founded the Amicable Divorce Network. So I'm going to talk to you all today about what that means, what amicable divorce is, and why it might be a good choice for you. Um, so the Amicable Divorce Network um, was founded in 2019. Um, we currently operate in all of Georgia and are expanding as of July 1st to accept members um, all over the world um, who have a resolution focus in the divorce industry. Um, so Lisa sort of touched on all of the different things that I do in the family law system. Um, and so I won't go through that list again. Uh, but the one thing that brought me to amicable divorce was being a frustrated family law attorney. And you might say, why were you frustrated? Um, the main reason um, was because I would have really good intentioned clients who would come to me and they would say, I really want a reasonable resolution to my divorce. Um, we have, you know, very identifiable assets. I, I want to get this, get through this in the best interest of my children. And I, you know, want to resolve my case efficiently. And I would say, great, you know, here's all the things that we need to do. And, you know, about 50% of the time, sometimes more, the other party um, would go hire an attorney who I would say was high conflict and it would send the case into a tailspin. And we would be having high cost, high conflict, because I would have to be reacting to those things to protect my client. You can't ignore them. You can't not participate in the process. And so I was very frustrated because I felt like whoever the other party chose to hire as an attorney, which could be based on seeing an advertisement online or a billboard and, and nothing else, was really dictating how the entire case would go. And so I wanted to find a way to um, really sort of control that. Um, so I founded the Amicable Divorce Network. Um, the network is a, it's a professional organization. We have members um, who do everything in the divorce industry, um, mental health professionals, mediators, arbitrators, uh, real estate agents, mortgage brokers, certified divorce lending professionals, certified divorce financial analysts, anybody that you would need in your divorce process. We have career coaches, life coaches, divorce coaches, all sorts of professionals. You're not required to use them all. Um, it is as needed. You can be assured that these professionals are vetted for being resolution focused, having experience, and um, wanting to work with you for a good resolution in your case. 
Um, we require five years of minimum experience. You also are vetted for having fair and transparent billing practices. Uh, the Amicable Divorce Network also provides for an out of court resolution to a divorce. We don't utilize the court system until it's time to finalize the divorce. And I'll get into that a little bit more, but all of our members have training in that process. So what parties sometimes don't understand before getting a divorce is that they can approach it really in three different ways. Um, so one way is called uncontested. And what that means to professionals is that you all have reached an agreement. Both, we call it a kitchen table agreement. Both parties sat down, they came up with all of their terms to the agreement, and they really just need a professional to um, draft it up for them. Now, a lot of times in this situation, we see parties trying to do it themselves where they go online, um, they use one of these online resources to try to DIY their divorce. They're gonna fill out the forms themselves, they're gonna draft the paperwork themselves. I strongly encourage people to not do that. Um, about 15 to 20% of the cases that I see in my practice involve trying to fix the mistakes that were done or people sign something that they didn't intend. They, maybe they came up with a custodial agreement without thinking it through, or they came up with a financial arrangement that often cannot be changed. Lots of problems. So even if you are uncontested, strongly encourage you to enlist the services of an attorney to draft that paperwork. I do that for a flat fee. Many other attorneys do as well, and you can get legal advice on drawing up that paperwork. Do not use online forms. If you learn nothing else today, learn that. Um, the third option, I'm just going to cut to the bottom, is what we call a traditional divorce, which is where somebody files a divorce in the court system. They have that party served with the action, maybe by law enforcement or a private process server, and that other party has 30 days to respond. That's what everybody sort of thinks of when they think of a divorce. An amicable divorce falls in the middle of those. Um, and so what is an amicable divorce? So with an amicable divorce, both parties have a low conflict attorney so that they have access to legal advice so that they know that the agreements that they're reaching are gonna be legally binding. They can have their questions answered. Just because it's called amicable does not mean that you have to agree with the other person. Um, there is negotiation. Um, we go back and forth. Sometimes we have a mediation um, to try to resolve the issues. What we are not doing is asking for five years of unnecessary documents. Um, we're not both hiring competing experts in a case. We're not threatening each other with, we're gonna file a motion against you in court. You have two attorneys who are able to speak to one another. When an issue arises, pick up the phone, resolve that issue, um, as opposed to spending thousands of dollars on threatening letters, motions, and a lot of negativity. We're able to focus on what are the real issues here, what information do we need to resolve those issues? Do we need to enlist other professionals to help us on our path for this family? And how can we get them resolved in their divorce case quickly and efficiently, keeping an eye on the children and what's best for them and keeping an eye on the full financial picture? Because in the divorce industry, unfortunately, the people that profit generally are the attorneys by driving up conflict that is completely unnecessary. I'm in Georgia, so I'm using the Georgia timeline for a divorce as a comparison. So the traditional timeline for a normal divorce, this is the one that starts with the filing of an action in the court system. That's what starts the case. Then the other person has 30 days to answer. You have a six month discovery period. There could be other potential things that occur, temporary hearings, a guardian ad litem, psychological, um, investigations or assessments, things of that nature. And only after all that is done, generally do parties then try to reach a resolution, sometimes through mediation. That's not always mandated in every county. It depends in our state where you are. Every county is different. And then if you don't reach a resolution, you can go to trial to have a resolution. With COVID, with um, the court systems being as backlogged as they are, 
um, in the jurisdictions I'm familiar with, getting to a final resolution, depending on what your other potential steps phase is right here, um, could take a year or more just to be able to get in front of a judge for a simple hearing. So I think it's really important for parties to understand that they can take the control into their own hands and they can reach a resolution that's best for their family. They can come up with creative decisions. So we have the amicable divorce process to address that. The, the attorneys talk, they come up with a framework for the case. They say, you know, I only need two weeks to get you this list of documents and I really need tax returns, a paycheck stub. We do verified financial statements. And then we say, you know, do we think we need a mediation? Let's schedule that for 30, 45 days from now. Your case can move as quick as you want it to, or it can be as slow as you want it to. There are some parties that really have a difficult time with the divorce process. Sometimes we have parties that have addiction issues. Maybe there's um, a pending sale of real estate we need to work through. So we're able to be creative to come up with a time frame that is best for this family. Sometimes therapy needs to occur. Sometimes co-parenting counseling. Every case is different. So with the amicable process, we're able to design a framework for the family and for what is needed. When you enter the court system, it's a one size fits all scenario. So many days to do this, so many days to do this, perhaps mandatory discovery, perhaps mediation in 90 days, perhaps all these other things that might happen that may not be best for your family. They may not be necessary. They could be too fast or too slow for your situation. So with the amicable process, we come up with that framework and we use out of court dispute resolution to reach an agreement that includes mediation. And then if the parties can't reach an agreement in mediation, we schedule an arbitration. So we are able to highly reduce the costs by a significant amount and the time that it takes to get divorced if that's what the parties want. We can also expand that time if that's what's necessary for that particular family. So if an amicable divorce sounds like something that you want or to recommend to a friend or family member, you can go to our website, which is very simple, amicabledivorcenetwork.com. We have all of our professionals listed. Um, if you're looking at this process, I would recommend starting with one of the attorneys. They've had training in the process, can weigh out your options for you. All of our attorneys are experienced, not just in amicable divorce, but all of the types of divorce that I mentioned earlier. So you can ask them your questions if this situation is good for you. Do you maybe fit into one of the other situations? Um, we have experienced professionals who can answer all your questions and advise you um, if an amicable divorce is good for you or one of the other choices. If you're a professional and you're looking at becoming a member, we extend invitations to members to join or you can fill out an application. They're also on our website or you can email me directly and I can send that to you. Um, our group has just an amazing group of professionals who really enjoy helping one another. We have education events, networking events, and soon we'll be offering a certification for a certified amicable divorce specialist and we have more on the horizon for the organization to come. We're currently serving Georgia, as I mentioned, July 1st. We're launching internationally. Um, if you want to follow us, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and have a YouTube channel where we post content and videos for people to be able to learn more about the process. Um, last year, we received a Georgia Legal Award for founding the network, um, which was a really big deal to be awarded to a family law professional. Um, we're endorsed by Divorceify and the Child Center Divorce Project. And of course, we have a partnership with Divorce Town USA. So we're really proud to be um, a part with them. So if anybody has any questions, um, please just let me know. I'm always happy to answer them. All right, Tracy, I'm uh, supposed to be coming back on camera. Here we go. Oh, that was terrific. And um, I can tell you folks that the Amicable Divorce Network and the processes that Tracy has created and will continue to create in her trainings and such are stellar. So you will be getting the best of the best. And everyone on this uh, webinar today is a member of Divorce Town USA and the Amicable Divorce Network because we also believe in the same principles of helping families to uh, save money on their finances and their future. 
and especially to keep the family unit intact in a way that it doesn't destroy it for the entire family forever. And so um, we're very happy about this partnership and, and it's really been working very nicely. And Tracy Ann, thank you so much thank for that you, great presentation. Absolutely. All right, next up, we have another colleague and someone that I've known for a long time. He and his wife are very special in my life. Andrew McConaughey is co-owner of McConaughey Counseling in Alpharetta with his wife, Tracy. They've been doing this for over 20 years that Andrew has specialized in working with couples in various stages of their relationship, including couples who are divorcing and those who are divorced and need co-parenting assistance. In any stage of a couple's relationship, Andrew help, hopes to help them develop the healthiest relationship possible. Andrew has been a member and served as the board president of the Collaborative Law Institute of Georgia, and he is currently a member of Divorce Town and the Amicable Divorce Network. And Andrew, always a pleasure to have you here. Um, we're going to listen to some great information today. And so I'm going to uh, turn myself off here and let you have the, the floor, <laughs> the stage, whatever we call it when we're online, right? <laughs> the, the video stage, yes. So as Lisa mentioned, um, my wife, Tracy, as opposed to Tracy Ann, um, and I have a practice in Alpharetta. And we have worked a lot with couples and families over the years um, in all different stages of the divorce process, including my wife specializes in working with children. And we, a couple of years ago, developed what we call the upside down divorce process. And I'm going to talk a little bit today about what that process is and how it's a little different than some of the different things we were discussing today. I think one thing we all have in common today is that we want to help people have the healthiest divorce possible. And I think there's a lot of different ways to go about doing it. So my wife and I, with the Upside Down Divorce Process, um, have our way that we suggest doing it also. So the reason why it's called the Upside Down Divorce Process is because instead of beginning with attorneys, um, the process begins with mental health professionals who are trained specifically with conflict management, uh, as well as developing parenting plans for a divorced couple. And so we would begin with working with this couple as a neutral party uh, with one of us working with the couple together. And we would help them learn how to communicate better with each other, how to navigate and negotiate and um, collaborate on a parenting plan agreement that would ultimately be filed with the court as an official document. And it would, we would also talk about how to talk to your children about the divorce situation and how to interact with each other post-divorce in the most appropriate, healthy way. Once we've gotten through the entire process of the parenting plan, um, the couple would take their parenting plan and they we would hand them off to a financial specialist like Lisa. So with Lisa, then we Lisa would help them with the financial their financial part of their uh, divorce process and come up with an agreement related to that. And then Lisa and myself would refer the couple to a, an attorney who would help with looking over the documents, the parenting plan document and the financial document. And this, this attorney or two attorneys uh, would look over these things and make sure they're all legal in the way they're supposed to be. And then the, the uh, attorneys would file with the courts um, to file the process. Tracy Ann is, of course, one of the attorneys that we use frequently um, because we trust her very much to uh, not blow up the process, whereas some attorneys might blow up the process. They might look at the documents that the couple have created and start pointing out, you know, I can't believe you agreed to this. This isn't fair. You can get more money than this. You shouldn't have to pay so much money. And after the couple has gone through all of the efforts to uh, make these documents, we absolutely do not want it to be um, blown up in, in the end because that's discouraging. It's gonna cost more money, it's gonna cost more conflict. And so we look for attorneys, both Lisa and myself and my wife, Tracy, to uh, refer to towards the end, to look over the documents and who also have the spirit of collaboration and cooperation and amicability with these divorce processes. So then they would look over it, make adjustments needed and then file with the courts. So essentially, 
it's upside down because it starts with the kids and the family first, and we get that taken care of, and then we move on to the financial part of it, and then we move on to the legal part of it. So we also really uh, put the family first because we want the parenting plan to be very separate from the financial agreement because we want the people to be able to focus on their relationship as co-parents and uh, what's best for the children without the finances getting involved with that process. So we try to get that first out of the way, then work on the finances and then work on the legal part of it. So that's the, in a nutshell, that's the upside down divorce process. If you're interested in getting more information about that, you can go to upsidedowndivorce.com and you can, or you can email me at andrew at mcconaugheecounseling.com, which is also on that website. And, or you can contact my wife, Tracy, also. Uh, thanks very much. All right, Andrew. Great information. And I, and you know, the, the whole idea of this uh, webinar today is that you've got options. Um, the traditional war of the roses, you know, duke it out uh, kind of divorce is not the way that most people want to go through this. You know, it's hard enough going through divorce and people are looking for better options, play, ways that they can have more control over the process and the decisions that they make. And that's what we're showing you here today. So Tracy Ann has shown you the amicable divorce way and Andrew is showing you another way where you can start with the children and then work with a financial neutral, someone who comes in to represent the, the piece doing the finances and then going to the attorneys for the drafting of the paperwork and putting all the terms together that you've agreed upon. And so this is just another option, the upside down for. So thank you so much, Andrew. That was great information. You're welcome. Okay, next up, I am so delighted to be introducing you to Tracy Gould Shinen, and she is the owner of Clarity Mediation. She has a bachelor's in psychology, a master's in peace studies, and has been a professor, professional mediator since 1999, and, and is now a certified parenting coach as well. She is registered with the Georgia Office of Dispute Resolution and is also a member of the Amical Divorce Network and the Association of Professional Family Mediators, as well as the um, Divorce Town USA team of folks that we have here. So we are so excited to have Tracy. She has a wonderful um, uh webinar that she runs called Clarity Conversations. And so I encourage you to uh, reach out and learn about that as well. And so Tracy, um, you have the virtual floor now. Uh, we've got a lot of Tracy's <laughs> going on here. So uh, there she is. All right. <laughs> Tracy Goldstein. Thank you. All right, great. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm always happy to share this kind of information with folks because uh, in my experience, people report they, they didn't know there were so many options. They believe that the only way to get started is what Tracy Ann said under the traditional divorce, uh, and that's not the case. So it's, it's really important that we share this information, and I'm going to go through um, a little bit more about mediation and how it fits into the process. As you've already heard, it can fit in a couple of different places. Um, so let's see if I can, there we go. Um, all right, so always great to start with a good quote. Uh, a good settlement is better than a good lawsuit. Uh, we watch these TV shows and think it's gonna be amazing in the courtroom, but there's so much um, strain and stress and money and time that goes into an actual settlement through trial that they don't show on TV. Um, so settling it privately can save a lot of those things. Um, court, it is public. That means that let's say COVID wasn't around and we were back in person all the time, like it used to be. Um, and even though we're on video now, a lot of the times for court, it's still public. Court is a public institution. So all that's to say is you don't know who's gonna be in the room listening to your private business. Most of us would rather not talk about our personal relationships in public. So remember that about court. Um, it's also very unpredictable. You don't know when the hearings are gonna happen, how long they're gonna go, if they're gonna get continued rescheduled, um, 
and you don't know the outcome. So it's, it's a real gamble. And that adds to the anxiety and stress that people are already experiencing with divorce. You already have so many unknowns. Um, so keep that in mind. And then of course, it's just kind of scary for us non-lawyers. I'm not a lawyer. I've been in court a lot and I still get intimidated. Um, it doesn't matter how much TV court you've watched. It's still scary. There are a lot of rules and procedures that we, we just don't know. And it's again, very intimidating. Um, as Tracy Ann said, it takes longer. It just takes a long time. There's a lot of people that want to get in front of a judge. And they have very important issues also. And uh, you just don't know how long it's going to take. Um, but it's definitely going to take longer than if you try to settle outside of court. And of course, it costs more. You've got uh, not only a longer process, but you're paying people to help you with that process, um, your attorneys and other professionals. And then you are going to have to miss work every time there's a hearing. Um, so there's that cost. Let's say you have to hire childcare that you normally wouldn't have to do. There's that cost. Uh, and then there's the emotional cost. It is stressful. I mean, divorce is stressful, but going to court is extra stressful. So there's a risk of cost there also. Uh, versus mediation, um, it is private. It is largely in your control. It is flexible, and we'll talk about each of these. Um, it is also individual. Um, these are very different from that public scary process. <laughs> Essentially what's said in mediation stays there. It is a private conversation between you, the other person, the mediator, and the other professionals that you might have there, attorneys, financial folks, whomever. So what you say stays. What goes out of mediation in writing, signed off on by you, filed in the court, then it becomes public. But all the conversations that you have that get you to that place stay nice and private. That includes your phone calls with the mediator, with each other, with your attorneys, uh, emails, and then caucus when you're in a mediation. Sometimes you might all be in the room together. And then other times you might split up into separate rooms, whether it's on video or in real life. Um, so you and your attorney are in a private room and the mediator goes back and forth. Those individual conversations are private, which are really nice to give you a chance to take a breath, take a break talk to your attorney privately, talk to the mediator privately. You can do that a little bit in court, but definitely not as much as you can in mediation. Um, to make the point about how important the confidentiality of mediation is and how uh, seriously we all take the privacy of mediation, just last year in 2020, a Zoom mediation happened. It was a court referred case and one of the parties live streamed the mediation to Facebook and uh, everyone was really upset <laughs> when they found out about it. They got figured out, the attorney or the mediator figured it out um, and let the court know. And um, that person spent a couple nights in jail. The judge uh, backed up the ethics of confidentiality to the highest level, took it very seriously, wanted to make the point that this is not OK. So um, I just uh, that hasn't happened in a long time. Of course, we didn't have to we didn't have to do video before, but that's how important it is. OK, let's do that first poll question. And I'm not sure. I believe you do that from the back end. Is that right? It's up. It's up. Cool. Okay. I don't know that I can see it, but I, oh, 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 there it is. Okay. So the question is, is it okay under the veil of confidentiality? Is it okay if a mediator tells a judge what happened in a mediation? If the judge asks, all right, well, what did he say? Or what did they say about that? Is it okay to tell the judge if you are the mediator? And I can't tell how many people have voted, but so far 100% are saying, yep, it's okay to tell the judge. And actually the answer is no, it is not okay. And I will tell you, judges will ask because they're curious, they're thorough, they're trying to do their jobs well. Um, but I have personally had to tell judges, sorry, can't answer that question. Your honor, uh, mediation is confidential and uh, they might be frustrated, but they respect it, so. Um, we really need it. All right. Uh, next up, the control aspect of the process. Um, 
you, like I said before, when you're in court, when you're under the judge's uh, sort of direction, you don't have control over the schedule, the hearings length, um, when they're going to be, and certainly not the outcome, because that's what you're asking the judge to do is to decide these things for you. In mediation, when any issue comes up, you have the option to say, yep, I'm in, sounds good to me, or absolutely not, <laughs> or the in-between one, which I really encourage folks to consider, uh, maybe. Um, you've got the time, you've got the flexibility, you've got the support to really consider the pros and cons of any given issue, path, outcome, before you commit to an answer. Um, I encourage folks to use the maybe option when they think it's a no, but before they say no, because once you say absolutely not to something, just human nature, it's hard to bring ourselves back from that. We often, uh, um, you know, it gets into our ego and our identity and we're like, no, I don't want to, I don't want to change my mind. I don't want to compromise. I already said no. Um, so we can trick ourselves in that way, um, in a negative way. So it can help to just throw that maybe in there. But you can't really say maybe to a judge. They won't go for that for very long. They're very busy. <laughs> so um, they also, they're going to decide for you large part. They do want your input, um, but ultimately they're going to tell you how it's going to be. Um, so ultimately, if you agree on the issues, you can settle nice and easy. Usually there's a good bit of compromise. No problem there, as long as everybody feels okay about the outcome. And the other option is if you don't agree on things, that's called an impasse. Now, sometimes impasses turn into settlement. These aren't permanent outcomes necessarily. Well, settlement can be, <laughs> but often impasse turns into settlement. Um, but just know that um, it's flexible and you have influence on that outcome. Obviously, you can't control the other person, but you control what your answer to the question is going to be. And I will say this. Often, I don't know how often because these are hard stats to find but or to get, uh, you might go to mediation and not settle on everything. You might settle on some things but impasse on other things or maybe you impasse on the whole enchilada. Everybody goes home, sleeps on it, marinates on it, thinks about it, softens a little and decides, yeah, I don't really need to be that strict about it. I could compromise a little bit more. And then a little bit down the road, you end up settling. So please remember that piece also. It's not always all or nothing. Sometimes you come around later or they come around later and you end up settling. Um, but you make that choice, whether it's a yes, no, a maybe, settlement, impasse. Um, and even if you impasse because you all disagree, just remember that's just how it's gone because that's how you've chosen it to be. And it feels different than if essentially you don't get your way because the judge says so you still had a voice in it. Um, it is a very flexible process in terms of both timing and the issues at the table. We can pick mediation at a time, Tracy Ann said this also. So you do the homework that you need. Maybe you need a little bit of discovery on some pay stubs and you gotta maybe get some doctor's records for the kids or something like that. So you get those things done and then you schedule your mediation at a time that works for you the other person, your attorneys, if you have them, any other professionals um, and the mediator. And so you've found a time that works versus being told this is when the court hearing is and you just got to be there and you don't know how long it's going to take. Also, on the um, way the sessions go, often it, it depends on the structure, if you have attorneys or not, um, and then the mediator's style. Um, sometimes you might have a mediation for just a couple of hours and you get everything done, boom, great, wrapped up. Sometimes it goes all day, like hours and hours, and you order lunch, <laughs> and that is just fine. Those work really well also. You knock out the whole thing in one long, exhausting day um, versus a short one. If that's what you need, you can do that. And then another way it goes sometimes is you might have um, multiple sessions. When I work with folks that don't have attorneys, that's what I like to do. We do like like three two-hour sessions. So we work on things, we go home, do some homework, sleep on it, work on things, come back. And in the meantime, I'm encouraging them to get professional advice, whether it's legal or financial, so that they're making the best decisions for themselves. But I find that that stretch works better, particularly when they don't have attorneys, because it gives them time to do that, time to think about it. But it's flexible. It's not a cookie cutter process. 
Uh, so the mediator controls the process in terms of keeping it flowing well, keeping it moving forward, reading room to see are folks just too exhausted to make good decisions or too frustrated, should we stop, should we keep going? But you, as the party, have opted into mediation. It is voluntary. So you've chosen to do this. I encourage you to choose your mediator, just like you would research and choose your attorney. Um, and so just like that, if or under the same vein, if you decide it's not working for you, either on that day or at all, you can always opt out. You've opted in, you can opt out. No one's going to force you to stay. Now, there might be consequences of that. Um, just like if you're in a courtroom, you could walk out. You can. <laughs> There's going to be consequences. But you do have that control. And the mediator isn't going to fine you or you know punish you or anything like that. Um, and similarly, just under normal human behavior, if you're going for a couple of hours and you're tired and you need a break, um, just ask for it and you can do that. And uh, it's totally okay. <laughs> We're very flexible in that way. Um, everybody's situation is different. Yes, divorces have certain areas that we all need to touch on as they're applicable, but even within that, your situation is going to be different from your neighbors or your sisters, um, whether it's the finances or the kids or the stuff, whatever it is, it's going to be unique to you and your family. Um, and not sort of the big buckets or the parenting plans for kids, if you have kids and then the money stuff, assets, debts, that sort of thing. But then there's personal property. That's all the things that you have. Judges do not want to hear about the pink crystal from your wedding and who's going to get that, but we can make room for that in mediation if it's important to you. Um, then other things that come up like future dating, what are the rules going to be around that for the parents? If there are kids, how do we handle that? We can talk about those kind of delicate things in mediation. Pets, <laughs> I have written up many uh, pet custodial and visitation plans. If you've shared a pet for a number of years and you are splitting, you still want to have you know access and time with your dog, that is totally fine. We can figure that out. Um, so that goes into the flexibility of it. It goes into the individualization of it. You have control over what we talk about largely. There's some things we have to talk about, but and there's some other sort of like non-required-ish things that if you want to, great. If you don't, that's okay too. And then we'll go through it and, and see what the outcome is going to be. Can we come up with a settlement? Or does this need some time to an other expert opinion to help you make some decisions? So that is some of the character. Those are the characteristics of mediation. They fit in, or mediation fits into the process in a number of places with the Amicable Divorce Network. Um, like Tracy Ann said, recommended they start with attorneys and then mediation is brought in sort of like when everybody's ready. But also, like Andrew said, when I have folks that don't have attorneys yet, we do it in that upside down way. We start working on the issues. We work on the parenting stuff largely first also um, and get a sketch of really what's going to work well and capture what there is agreement on and then sort of continue to start chipping away at where there's not quite agreement yet. And then I'm always encouraging folks to, yes, get your legal advice, get your financial advice and have this reviewed by an attorney before you sign it. And just like Andrew said, I recommend attorneys that are going to review it with their settlement minded approach versus blowing it up and making it a more complex case than it needs to be. OK, I'm going to wrap up with the last poll, and that is about the federal justice centers. In the late 70s, the feds under the Department of Justice initiated some pilot programs where they created um, neighborhood justice centers where they did mediation. And it was really sort of progressive at the time, but of course it was the 70s. And um, they saw all kinds of neighborhood stuff. And um, to, the idea to settle it locally, build community bonds and keep stuff out of the courts. They went for a little while. One of them are, is still operating. Which city do you think still operates a neighborhood justice center? Kansas City, Missouri, Atlanta, or LA? Anybody, anybody, can you vote? Just take a guess. Wow. Okay, it's Atlanta. We have it here. They still mediate. It's pretty great. It's the only one remaining and we're pretty proud of it. Oh, that's that. 
So that is it for me. Uh, this is my contact information. If you want to uh, reach me, screenshot it. I know that it's going to be in the chat also, I believe. Um, and always happy to talk about mediation. And if you think it might be a fit, we can go through that and see if you think it, if it really is or not. I think you're muted, Lisa. There. Does that work? The third time a charm? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. That was terrific. So, folks, you have gotten um, uh, a lot of information here today on different ways that you can go through this. And, and I want to say that there's also, you can combine them. You know, you may pick a piece of this and a piece of that and work with an attorney within the Amicable Divorce Network. And so, you have choices and you can come into this process of divorce through multiple ways. Just make sure that you're working with professionals who have your best interest in mind, who have the experience to help you and who are here to help you get through this in the best way possible at the lowest cost without destroying your family and you'll be okay. And, um, you know, that's what these why I wanted to bring you all of these different options. I just wanted to um, add a little tale to this um, since you, we just talked about mediation and then I think we have a, a private question here that I will pose. Um, but you know, there is a difference and Trace, both Tracy's, we've got Tracy's going on everywhere, including Andrew's wife, uh, but uh, both Tracy's can speak to this. Um, there's a difference between hiring, or hiring a private mediator and being mandated mandated to go to court through, um, you know, the process, the traditional divorce process. Um, my experience has been that, you know, when you have a private mediator, you can take those breaks as needed. You can, um, you know, have smaller sessions and come back and do homework in between. But when I've been involved in court mandated mediations, they're kind of like a marathon, you know, you're trying to get this done and running through the day as fast as possible. And there's a lot more pressure put upon people to make decisions on things that they may not be ready to at that point in time. Do either of you want to speak to that? I think it's important that people understand that distinction. I think it depends. Um, I'm a private mediator and a court mandated mediator. So um, in Georgia, the way that it works is you have to have certain experience to be approved by the court, but that also means the court office can appoint you on cases. Um, so I might get a notice that I'm supposed to be the mediator in a certain case on a certain day that they didn't schedule with me. Um, so that's a one situation. But there is another situation, which I think you're touching on, Lisa, which is where you're actually at court and they and the judge will say, we have two or three mediators here today. And before I have your hearing, you have to go talk to this mediator and try to work it out. And yes, in that situation, it's usually very high pressure. Um, you know, very frantic and you really are sort of under the gun to try to get something done or have this very, you know, contested hearing. Um, and so that's can often be a very stressful and negative situation for people. Yes. And, and I also was speaking to the fact that people can hire a mediator privately, but without having filed in the courts and, and, you know, have more control over the process that way. So, you know, you brought to light even a, another situation where people do feel that stress put upon themselves. And that's why this process that you've created, that Andrew has created, that Tracy Shinen uh, works through, you know, allowing people to have control of their own particular situation. It, it's empowering at a time when you feel like you're out of control in every other way to have some control of this process that you must go through if you're getting a divorce. And Tracy, um, Shinen, would you like to speak to that at all? Yeah, just to really second what Tracy Ann said, um, if you, uh, sometimes I'm a court appointed mediator also, and I would be on site. And like you described, the judge says, go mediate. And usually those folks had no idea they were going to mediate that day. And so now all of a sudden they're like, what are we doing? <laughs> and that said, sometimes it works beautifully. Um, but other times they're not ready to mediate. They're not prepared. And it's it's extra frustrating because it feels like a waste of time. What are we doing? And now they're sort of have to wait for the judge to get back to them that day. Um, so it's, again, unpredictable. 
Um, if you already have filed with the court and you've been ordered to mediate, now you still can pick your mediator and schedule it at a time that's more convenient, but you have to know that you can do that. Now you do <laughs> and or have attorneys that do that for you. So there's a lot of nuance there. You can still gain some control if you know how to do that. But the most is what we've all said. The most control you can have is if you just keep it out of the court for, <laughs> until you get it done yourself. So you hire your people, you mediate when you're ready, um, and then you take it to court. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let me see uh, this question here. Marcella, did you, uh, it seems to have disappeared off my screen. I there. have it. Okay. It's, she says, I'm interested in mediation, but my spouse is manipulative and at times abusive. How would I still be protected if I choose mediation? That's where having a good attorney can really help <laughs> in addition to many other places. Because <laughs> uh, the mediator, we, you know, I can, I can really help balance the conversation um, and keep it moving forward and, and, you know, help identify when things are, you know, becoming unbalanced. But if one person is very manipulative or if there are addiction issues or personality disorder issues, if it's kind of extreme like that, I can only do so much with the two people versus if there's an attorney in place, um, they can advocate for their client. They can um, sort of be a little bit um, more direct about things, if you will. So that can really help a lot. Do, do you, uh, Andrew or Tracy Ann want to say anything to that? I mean, I, I totally agree with Tracy. I would say in those complicated situations, you, you do want to have an attorney because I'm often saying like, I'll be the jerk. Like, or you can blame it on me. Like I'll be, and I will stand between, you don't have to negotiate with them. You don't have to talk to them. You don't have to see them. Like that's my job for you, the client. And so, you know, especially with, you know, narcissists, we see a lot of that or, you know, other personality disorders, you know, I'll be the bad guy. That's what, you know, you pay your attorney for to protect you and stand in the middle um, so that there's not that direct line, um, which can be so stressful. Um, you know, emotionally, you know, and, and obviously has brought you to the point that you're at. So get somebody um, to help you out. Just one thing to Tracy Goldshine and mentioned caucus, which is probably also an option in that situation. You don't have to be in the same room. Right. Yep, that's true. And that really helps when there's any um, any of that high conflict stuff or intimidation. If you feel that you can't speak for yourself well because the other person is glaring at you. Yep. Then having folks just completely in separate rooms, like Tracy and said, so you don't even see each other. Then you're able to communicate and advocate for yourself along with your attorney um, in a much safer, um, empowered way. And then I'm the bad guy, <laughs> the nice bad guy going back and forth and, um, you know, carrying the messages. And, um, you know, part of the mediator's job is to communicate the, the core message well. So even if they're saying all this ugly stuff over here, I listen to it, but then I take from it what what's valid and helpful and going to help move the case forward. And I take that back to the more vulnerable person who's feeling intimidated and I leave the junk over there. Andrew, anything on your end here? I think you're kind of frozen here. Have we? Is your connection okay? We're I don't. We're not getting voice either. Well, we'll just um, let if you if you can get that on, feel free to jump in. I I can tell by the way you were shaking your head that uh, you are definitely in sync with. Um, what is being said here. And um, again, we know as professionals in this field that- Can you hear, can you hear me now? Oh Lisa? yes, we can. Yes, absolutely. We don't see you, but we hear you. There you are. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I think Marcella. Okay, I think Marcella, I think Marcella fixed me. Um, so yeah, I would just agree with all of what's been said. Absolutely. And um, yes, if, if you- Oops. We're just having some technical issues here, folks. We the joys of some internet. <laughs> yeah. internet issues. All right. I have a quick um, question for Tracy, for Tracy Ann, while he's, um, while Andrew's reconnecting. Yeah. Um, because, Tra because the Amical Divorce Network is in Georgia until July 1st, 
Um, and there are people registered for the webinar from all over the U.S. and possibly in Canada. Do you have any suggestions for somebody that wants to divorce amicably but may not have access specifically to your network? What can they do? What should they ask for? What should they look for? <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, we have some resources on our website um, that you can look at. Um, you know, when we do open up, we'll have members, hopefully, you know, that can help you in your area um, if your divorce isn't happening right now. Um, if it is, you're welcome to reach out to me, to Lisa, um, to somebody else um, in our network, because we actually um, have a, a vast network and know who those amicable people are, whether they are here. Um, we actually already have members in California we can reach out to or, or somewhere else because we do events like this and we're part of larger organizations like, you know, Divorce Town and others that we do come across those um, resolution minded professionals that we can point you in the right direction. And if we just happen to not know anybody in that area, we can give you some key questions to ask. Um, a lot of people um, don't ask the right questions to attorneys. There is um, an article on our blog that I wrote about questions you should be asking an attorney that nobody's ever asked me um, about their billing practices and their philosophy on things to make sure that it aligns with yours. Because just because you saw an advertisement and went to that attorney does not mean that that attorney aligns with your goals for your family and for your case. So um, it is sort of like um, a first date, you know, so you don't have to get married to them, you know, ask the right questions and see if they're a good fit because it is an important relationship. Absolutely. Great, great. And um, at divorcemoneymatters.com, we also have a divorce financial fitness kit. And there is a list of questions there to ask attorneys that you might not have considered as well. Because as Tracy Ann said, this is a very important relationship in your life to help you move forward. And you do not want to end up having to divorce your divorce attorney as well. We've all seen a lot of that. And that just makes a stressful situation all that much more. So get the right folks in place from the beginning because divorce does take a team. This is not a one person. And generally, unless you have a very uncomplicated matter, you're going to need a team of folks. You're going to need legal advice, financial advice, uh, therapeutic advice, and someone to help guide you through all of these decisions to make. So there may be others and, and anybody on this panel here and others that we are in line with can help you with those decisions. Um, and there's ancillary members as well. You know, you may need to get real estate people involved and uh, mortgage questions answered and insurance matters. And so it can expand uh, in many directions, but we can, all, as professionals, can help you tie those pieces together through the professionals in our networks. And I see Andrew has made it back. So let's let Andrew finish that uh, question that he was answering. All right. Can you hear me and see me this time? Yes, we can. Okay, awesome. Uh, I guess I was just agreeing with everybody else's uh, comments. And especially when you have a very difficult, contentious situation, you still don't want to go to court if you can avoid it. But if you can have an attorney that's your advocate there with you, maybe during mediation or whatever, that's very, very helpful to have somebody sitting there with you and kind of empowering you. Um, so I would still like I think we're all in agreement that going to court is like the last resort that you don't really want to do that. Um, and even in that situation, I think you can maybe prevent it from happening if you use uh, like an amicable attorney with a good mediator. So that's all I was going to say. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, interestingly, statistics show that about 90% of cases that are headed to court do settle uh, right up until, you know, on the courthouse steps. So you could have spent a lot of money for your attorney to prepare going to court and, you know, end up settling out of court anyway. Um, a lot of people also don't understand that, um, you know, getting an attorney and a retainer and all of that, that, you know, you have to continue to refill the retainer. And as long as your case is continuing along, you're going to continue uh, making those refills. And um, the average case in America is stated to be somewhere between fifteen to $25,000 per spouse uh, for just your legal fees. And that is not even getting you to court. Um, so if you're going to get to court, when we say get to court, we mean having a judge or a jury decide for you. If you're going to go that route, it is probably going to be tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, depending on how complicated your case is. Um, much more, that much more. So 
Um, starting with the amicable divorce network, starting with the upside down divorce process, starting with uh, a mediator, uh, a clarity mediation session, starting with the financial neutral who can help you sort out all the finances and then send you and connect you with all the right folks. You have options and they will surely save your mind, your money, and your family's future. So thank you for joining us today. Marcella, do we have any more questions here? That was it. Um, just one other thing, just from all the years we've been doing this together. Um, we do see a lot of cases they can they can agree on almost everything, but maybe there's just that one thing, like Tracy said, that they might have an impasse on, and maybe they have to go to court for that one thing. What do you suggest? Is it better to have as much of an agreement as possible? Can you can you do a settlement agreement with one thing left out that you need the judge to decide? Is that better than nothing? I'll just say first, you don't have to go to court and I don't recommend it. Um, arbitrate. You can arbitrate. Um, so um, it's something a lot of people don't utilize. And so what an arbitration is, is an individual. Um, I do this, retired judges do this, other attorneys that have training. And so when you have that one issue, there's no reason to sit on a court calendar for six months and spend fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 to have your one issue resolved. You can schedule a time just like you do with the mediation with a professional arbitrator and you vest them with the authority to make the decision. Um, both parties can still present their case, present documents, even have witnesses. A court reporter can take it down. It's as formal as or as informal as you want it to be. And that person can make the decision. They usually um, have a lot more attention to give you. Um, because they don't have 50 cases that day. Um, they usually have the knowledge and experience um, similar to a judge, if not being a retired judge. And you can pick the date and time for your resolution. Um, and it's a lot more cost effective and time efficient. So um, to answer your question, I would say, and I think Tracy would agree, get as much of an agreement as you can. Um, you know, get it, capture all the issues that you can for that agreement. But, but don't think that you have to put it into the court system um, because uh, that's just always a terrible resolution for families. Try arbitration as a, an option to resolution. It, it's far more efficient and uh, better for families. Yes, I will say that, you know, Mead Arb is uh, what it's been called. Mead Arb is this combination of using mediation to settle as much as possible and then using arbitration for those things that you can't. And as you've heard, it's uh, cost efficient and it's a way to stay out of the court system. So there's another option that many folks are not aware of. So thank you for that great uh, question, Marcella. And um, I just want to thank all of my esteemed guests here today. You guys are just stellar in your profession and uh, to work with. I am grateful for all of you as members of Divorce Town and for the information that you help us provide to the community much needed information so that we can help folks know that there are better ways to divorce, healthier ways. And today we've talked about those. So thank you all very much. Thank and you. if everybody wants to put their information in the chat before you leave, because we will be sending out the uh, recording here, uh, that way folks know how to uh, connect with you at divorcetownusa.com. You can all be found. And um, in case anybody is interested in getting your information directly, We'll have that here. All right. This has been a wonderful call. Thank you all so much. Much appreciation. Everyone have a great week and a great month. And we'll see you back here next month. Um, Marcella, what is our topic next month, by the way? Next on. month is real estate and divorce. Should I stay or should I sell? Oh, don't want to miss that one, folks. This is a big place where people uh, make a lot of um, improper choices because they're just not informed. And let me say one last thing before we close. And I meant to say this. I see mediation as just this fantastic opportunity for people to go and uh, make some of the most important decisions in their life. And what I also see over the years is that many people have no idea what it is they don't prepare properly. Um, their attorneys don't school them on what to expect. And so they make, um, many times they don't make the best use of it. So I want you, if you are in this situation, to understand what this day is all about, how important it is for you. Go and prepare, do your financial planning work ahead of time. 
work with somebody who understands the finances of divorce and speak with your attorney so you understand their strategies, what to expect that day. Go in prepared. Even a divorce coach or a mediation coach is a valuable thing to to uh, work, a, a valuable person to work with and uh, provide yourself that service so that you can make the most of that very important day in your life. And so I will leave you all with that. Any last uh, comments here, ladies and gentlemen? All right, guys, thank, thank you. you very much and have a good month. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.